Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So friends welcome to another important segment of uh, looking to the introductory rural sociology in terms of continuity and change. And within that framework uh, we try to see that uh, what can be the possible ways in which we try to explore the rural sociology. And uh, as we have discussed in the previous lectures that uh, when we try to speak about its emergence or we try to speak about uh, the theoretical and the methodological issues. And of course, when we try to see in uh, unit third speaking about the sociological analysis of the rural phenomenon, I think uh, we have set the tone towards the understanding about uh, the rural sociology. But I think uh, uh, we also have to deal with another important category uh, which we try to see more in terms of. Uh, looking to the rural society because when we try to speak about the uh, rural sociology, one important thing that comes into our mind is the population. And who is this population or uh, what are the specific labeling of this population? So, we normally try to see it in terms of conceptualizing peasantry that is basically uh, another important uh, concept to deal with when we try to speak about rural sociology. So, I think uh, in uh, segment 4 of unit 1, we basically will try to see the understanding of peasant. I think uh, when we try to speak about the notion of peasant, uh, it has something to do with uh, the rural society and that way if we try to see, we basically try to find out that the peasant are the people who represent the rural. Like if you can recall that uh, peasants were basically the people who were dominating in the agrarian sector especially in the countryside and they are the people who basically are the core of the rural society. And in that way I think uh, the understanding of the peasant as a concept and also the peasant society becomes a crucial issue. And here in this lecture, we are basically going to speak about many component uh, which are going to be crucial when we try to speak about the understanding of peasant. I think uh, if we try to see, uh, there are numerous anthropological studies uh, which has been conducted, which are basically speaking about the understanding of the peasant society. And, uh, these peasant studies basically try to explore the understanding of peasant in a specific way. But what is more important of course is that how they have come into the mainstream framework uh, that is going to be crucial. And I think uh, there are group of peoples who basically can be seen in terms of understanding about the peasants. So apart from anthropological, if you try to see, I think uh, basically uh, we have talked about Robert Redfield's contribution when he was speaking about the village Tepeslon. So, Robert Redfield's understanding about the Tepeslon uh, in terms of the concept of the folk society, we have spoken at length that the folk society is marked by the presence of the peasant society. And apart from that, I think now the time has come where we have the advent of the political science and sociology which basically try to address upon the issue of uh, the peasant. And that way of course, I think uh, we try to see that the growth of peasant in terms of concept especially in the Europe and the European heartland has been marked by the debate and the discourse which has been generated by the sociologist and the political scientist. So, we try to see a mix of uh, academicians who have come into the prominence and they try to highlight the peasantry in various perspective. And in that way, I think uh, one significant name uh, that deserves 
attention is the contribution of Shannon. So, we have Theodore Shannon uh, whose contribution in terms of the specific work that is speaking about the peasants and the peasant society. That work become the one of the remarkable work when we try to see uh, in terms of the understanding of the peasant uh, in a specific theoretical framework. But before that I think uh, let us try to have the broader understanding about how the peasants have been visualized and if we try to understand the peasant society in various framework, we try to find out that at the initial level the peasantry were basically seen as the homogeneous categories. They were seen as the homogeneous categories and uh, in that context if you try to see uh, we have various facets or we have the various dimensions in which the peasantry has been located. Like if you try to see the cultural viewpoint, if you try to see the cultural viewpoint then we try to find out the contribution of Krober and Krober basically he was trying to speak about in 1948 about the understanding of the peasantry and what he says that he was the first to define the concept of peasant uh, in a more systematic way. So, systematic analysis of peasantry has been started by uh, Krober and he treated them as a homogeneous category as I mentioned earlier that uh, trying to see peasantry as a homogeneous category has been invented upon by Krober and he tries to see in terms of what? He tried to see it in terms of peasant which constitute the part societies with the part culture, part societies with part culture that is going to be crucial because when we try to see the understanding of peasant I think they are to be seen definitely living in the rural, but they are in relation with the wider society in the relation with the market. So, we try to see that uh, uh, Krober's understanding about uh, the peasant was seen in a cultural context where we try to speak about that he was trying to represent the uh, understanding of peasant in terms of the part society and part culture and in that way they are basically located in both the domain. We have partly location in the rural society and also we try to see that they are also located in the open segment of what we say uh, the town centered market, town centered market. So, I think uh, this is how we try to see the understanding of the present as has been discussed by Krober. Then another name uh, which deserves attention basically with regard to the understanding of present is we try to speak about the contribution of Raymond Firth. Raymond Firth when he was trying to analyze the understanding of the peasantry, uh, he was basically referring to uh, the understanding of the peasantry in terms of uh, uh, one can say the economic referent. So, we have the understanding of Krober in terms of the cultural referent and we try to see the contribution of Raymond Firth in terms of the economic referent and what Raymond Firth says that he says that present are what? They are as a system of small producers, system of small producers with a simple technology, with a simple technology and the equipment of simple technology and the equipment often relying primarily for their subsistence primarily for their subsistence. So, that becomes crucial that whatsoever they are producing they are basically producing for their own subsistence on whatsoever they have produced. So, the primary means of the livelihood for the peasants is the cultivation of soil, 
cultivation of soil is the primary occupation of the peasantry and I think when he was trying to speak about he also refer it in terms of the small scale producers that present definitely falls into the domain of the small scale producers. And that way if you try to see we try to find out that it may include the categories of fishermen and also the category of the craftsmen along with the cultivators. So, I think uh, if you try to see uh, the peasants have been located in the a small scale production unit and that way the important parameter on the basis of which the peasantry are to be understood was to be seen in terms of that how or where they are located in the market economy or in terms of the production unit and we try to find out that uh, they are basically into the category of small producers. Now another way in which we try to see the understanding of peasant was been discussed by Robert Redfield. Robert Redfield who was also trying to speak about the understanding of the peasantry especially uh, we have discussed about uh, the folk society uh, where he is trying to focus upon that folk society which is marked by the presence of the peasants and that way if you try to see that what the peasant is according to Robert Redfield. So, Robert Redfield considered peasants to have the characteristics have the characteristics and what is that characteristics in following the agriculture as in following the agriculture as a livelihood and, and, a, and a way of life livelihood and as a way of life. I think uh, uh, this is, is important because when we try to see agriculture in terms of not only the livelihood, not only the substance, but we try to see it as a way of life that becomes important and it is not seen in terms of business and not as a business. So, I think categorically we are trying to focus upon the fact that it is the livelihood alone uh, which is going to be important. So, we try to see that uh, uh, we also have another important uh, uh, distinction uh, which we try to see that who are the people who carry forward the business. So, he says that those who use the land for the market, those who use the land for the market, they are basically called as the farmers. So, we try to see the basic distinction is coming between the peasant and the farmers that peasants are those who are basically putting their labor doing agriculture for their own subsistence of the livelihood. On the other hand, if you try to see the farmers, they are basically the people who are using the land for the market and we try to see them in terms of capital commodity. So, I think uh, the capital commodity becomes an important issue and we also try to see that uh, they are having its linkage uh, with the specific segment they are in relation with the great tradition also. So, we have the linkage of the peasants uh, with the great tradition in a specific sense, but what is more important is that when we try to see uh, Redfield's understanding, he basically tried to focus upon one important issue that is trying to speak about that how peasantry are to be seen in terms of the distinguished categories and we try to find out that uh, the peasantry are basically seen as the people who are basically doing the agriculture in terms of a way of life. And I think uh, if we try to move ahead, uh, we have another important contribution that is by Chenov. We have the contribution of Chenov uh, who was trying to see peasantry uh, more in terms of uh, an economic category and more in terms of class. So, this is how we try to see the transition has taken place. I think uh, when Cheno was speaking about the contribution, he was basically referring to the peasantry in terms of a major shift. But I think uh, uh, when Cheno was trying to understand the peasantry, he was basically trying to see it in terms of uh, his famous work that is the theory of peasant behavior. The theory of peasant behavior where he is trying to speak at uh, in detail about the understanding of the 
presents. So, in his view, the presents are motivations are quite different from presents motivation are quite different from the those who are the capitalist. So, presentry basically involves the specific present behavior and their motivation are being very different from the capitalist. I think uh, he was basically trying to uh, seek for the shift uh, which has taken place in the society especially with the advent of the capitalism how the peasantry has to uh, see their survival. So, we try to see that what Cheno was trying to speak about is that their basic aim is to providing for the minimum needs, minimum needs of the family rather than the market profit, rather than the market profit. So, we try to see that uh, the present behavior is basically seen in terms of the specific needs of the family and their concern for the market in terms of profit is going to be secondary. And he says that the family is equipped with the means of production, the family, present family is equipped with the means of production in terms of what? In terms of the use of the labor power, labor power for cultivating the soil, labor power to cultivate the soil that becomes the crucial issue for the understanding of the present behavior and what they receive as the year's work, what they receive as the year's work in terms of amount of the labor which they have put and that particular good is going to be crucial for them. So, the present behavior is basically seen as their own efforts, the family members trying to contribute throughout the year and whatsoever they are producing is going to be crucial for understanding what the present is. So, he is trying to see the present in terms of a specific class and also he is trying to see its linkage in the capitalistic mode. I think uh, we will try to speak about these particular issues uh, in the later phase uh, how peasantry has moved towards the other dimensions. But I think uh, one specific name as I suggested uh, which deserves special attention is trying to speak about the contribution of Theodor Shenin was seen as a landmark uh, uh, person uh, who tried to speak about the peasantry in a very focused way especially when we try to see that uh, what he is trying to speak about the peasantry is that and he tries to define it in terms of the peasantry especially uh, to him the peasantry consists of what? The peasantry peasants are what? Do consist of the small agriculture producers, consist of small agricultural producers who with the help of the simple equipments, who with the help of simple equipments and the labor of their families and the labor of their families produce mainly for their own consumption, produce for their own consumption. I think this becomes crucial when we try to speak about uh, Shannon's analysis of peasants that they are the producers, agricultural producers who with the help of simple equipments are producing with the labor of their families and that is basically meant for their consumption. But he is also trying to speak about the question of surplus and which he tried to see in terms of their own consumption as well as to fulfill the obligations, to fulfill the obligations of the holders of the political and economic power, political and economic power. I think uh, this is how we try to see understanding of peasantry in terms of uh, the utilization of the produce basically meant for the uh, obligations for the economic and the political uh, holders of the power. So, we try to see that they are using the produce basically for the obligation also uh, which is trying to be seen in terms of surplus. So, I think uh, the question of surplus is going to be diluted because this surplus if they have they are basically trying to satisfy the 
needs for the holders of the political and the economic power. And in that capacity, if you try to see, we basically try to see that uh, the understanding of the peasantry are to be seen more in terms of uh, the specific uh, parameters. And that is where the contribution of Shannon becomes important. That how he was trying to see them as a specific uh, community. And we try to see that he was speaking about the four facets of the present society four facets of the present society uh, which we try to see in terms of uh, the specific characteristics of the present society. The first of course is that the present family farm is basically seen as the unit of multidimensional seen as a unit of multidimensional social organization i think when we try to speak about that the basic understanding is that uh, the family farm is not simply seen as uh, what you can say the simple uh, economic uh, activity rather we try to see them in terms of the economic producers then we try to see them in terms of the consumers also and also to some extent the distribution distribution of the goods and also they try to fulfill the need of the family. So, I think uh, uh, this is how we try to see the multidimensionality of the present family farm. So, the present family farm is going to be a crucial issue uh, which Shannon is trying to pinpoint. Then another important contribution if you try to see is in terms of looking to the question of land husbandry looking to the question of land husbandry as the main means of livelihood as the main means of livelihood. I think that becomes crucial because uh, land is going to be an important variable when we try to speak about the understanding of the peasants. And then the third thing which we try to see uh, which uh, Shannon has pinpointed with regard to the peasantry is trying to speak about the specific traditional culture specific traditional culture and here the basic understanding of course is to be seen in terms of the way of life and uh, I think uh, uh, this basically speaks about uh, uh, their motivation that speaks about uh, their day to day activities that speaks about the various norms which are associated with the peasantry and also it speaks about uh, the sort of conformist attitude conformist attitude. So, I think uh, these are the different component uh, which is seen with regard to the peasantry in terms of the traditional culture. And the fourth thing uh, which has been talked about by Shannon is trying to see them as the underdog position, trying to see them as underdog position. And this basically underdog position represents what? it basically represents the domination of peasants by the outsider, domination of peasant by the outsiders. So, this is going to be crucial because they are put at length from the power positions, peasantry are not going to be involved with regard to the power positions and sometimes we try to see that uh, see they are basically the economic exploiters, uh, they have been expo uh, economically exploited in terms of uh, uh, their underdog position. So, we try to see that uh, these are the different ways in which we try to understand the notion of uh, presence as has been discussed. And uh, if you try to go beyond in terms of understanding of the peasantry, we try to find out the contribution of another significant person that is John S. Saul and Roger Woods. John S. Saul and Roger Woods who tries to see present are those present are those whose ultimate security ultimate security and subsistence ultimate security and subsistence lies in their having certain right over the land 
certain right over their land that becomes an important issue and in the labor labor of the family labor of the family that becomes crucial for the understanding of uh, the peasants uh, who are basically involved with certain rights and obligations. So, there are rights and obligations which are associated with the peasant family farms and he is trying to see them in terms of the wider economic system, wider economic system uh, which includes the participation of the non-peasants. So, wider economic system involves their interaction with the non-economic non-peasant society. So, this is how we try to see that John Small and Roger Woods try to understand the peasantry. Then we try to see the contribution of Fowler. Uh, Fowler was trying to see peasant society as being society uh, which constitutes which constitutes the units and are semi autonomous which are seen as the semi autonomous local communities and we try to see within that semi autonomous culture too semi autonomous culture too. So, we try to see they are the semi autonomous local communities in the semi autonomous culture that is how we try to see the uh, failure was trying to understand the peasant and if we try to move ahead we try to have another significant contribution by Eric Wolf and Eric Wolf was basically speaking about the peasantry in terms of making the distinction of peasant with the farmers. So, what he says that what the peasant are? The peasants are the farmers who grows and raise livestock, raise livestock in the rural areas. So, I think uh, the domain lies within the rural areas, but they are not like the commercial farmers. So, they are unlike the commercial American farmers. They are unlike the commercial American farmers who are concentrated with satisfying the needs of the household rather than obtaining a profit. So, basically they are trying to uh, produce basically for their own consumption and for their own satisfaction rather than trying to have certain amount of uh, uh, understanding for the profit making. So, the component of profit making uh, is missing when we try to speak about the Eric Wolf's understanding about the present. Then we also try to see another significant name that is Daniel Thorner. Daniel Thorner was basically speaking about the understanding of peasantry and uh, he was trying to see in terms of the peasant economy. He was trying to see in terms of the peasant economy. So, in his view what is going to be important is that they are seen as the subsistence, subsistence of specialist and the peasants produce for exchange with the urban for exchange with the urban and that go is going to be important the family is the main unit of production main unit of production is the family. So, that is going to be important when we try to speak about Daniel Thorner's understanding about uh, the peasantry and I think uh, one name that uh, requires the special significance is uh, which is going to be an important uh, category for understanding the peasant is the contribution of Karl Marx. So, when we try to see Karl Marx uh, his contribution uh, we try to find out that uh, he was trying to speak about the peasantry as what he was trying to see peasantry in terms of the small holdings peasants that forms 
the vast mass that forms the vast mass and whose members live in the similar condition whose members live in the similar condition of what similar condition without entering into manifold relation without entering into manifold relation is going to be important and their mode of production this is going to be important that their mode of production isolates them from one another isolates them from one another so we try to see that uh, what we try to speak about that it is the present uh, life the peasantry itself uh, which is basically seen as creating the sort of alienation or distancing from the others and the reason for that is basically that the peasantry are so much involved with themselves that they are not in a position to interact with the outside world. So, I think uh, their whole life cycle is in such a fashion that they basically try to see that uh, their business or maybe if you try to see their involvement that is too much that it is not in a position to make them the space for interaction with the wider society. So, I think uh, this is where lies the contribution of uh, Marx and which basically tries to see that uh, the peasantry is a group of people who are basically seen in terms of isolation and they are basically there is a famous uh, statement uh, which is been used by uh, Marx in terms of analysis of peasantry that is they are just like the sack of potatoes. So, they are just like the sack, the sack of potatoes that of course, is a famous statement which has been made by Karl Marx for analyzing and understanding the peasantry. But what is more important is that when Marx was trying to speak about the contribution uh, of the peasantry, he was trying to speak about in a specific sense. And uh, there of course, I think uh, if we try to analyze further, we try to find out that he was basically speaking about the 18th Brumaire He was basically speaking about the 18th Brumaire, uh, which is going to be an important issue with regard to the analysis of peasantry. I think uh, we already uh, had some understanding and grasping about uh, the peasantry, but what is going to be more crucial is that if we have the detailed analysis of uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, thinkers uh, who try to have the contribution towards the understanding of the peasantry. Like I think uh, in the coming lectures in unit 2, we will try to speak about the contribution of Shannon in detail, we will try to speak about the contribution of uh, Karl Marx, we will also try to speak about the contribution of uh, uh, A. V. Chenov and also we try to see the contribution of uh, uh, what you can say speaking about the notion of moral economy, uh, which of course is going to give a different color to the understanding of the peasantry. And also we try to see that how the peasantry has been revisited uh, in terms of the capitalistic era, especially the contribution of Chenov in that framework is going to be important. Now, I think uh, when we try to speak at length about how the different peoples they try to have their understanding about the peasantry, especially like we try to speak about Eric Wolf's contribution, uh, which we have referred that he tries to make a distinction between the farmers and the peasantry that they are not meant for the profit making. And uh, the significant work of Eric Wolf lies is uh, peasants uh, which basically has came, came in 1966 and another significant work in which he is trying to speak about the peasantry is the peasant wars of the peasant war of the 20th century. 20th century. So, that is another significant work uh, which came in 1969 and that is going to be the important contribution of Eric Wolf, where he is also trying to make the understanding of the present in relation to the wider society. And I think uh, uh, Chenov's contribution uh, which we try to see in terms of the theory of present economy, we are going to talk about this particular issue in detail when we will deal with these issues. 
uh, I think when we try to have the differential understanding about the peasantry, especially we try to see at length how the different scholars they try to understand and analyze the peasantry, we try to find out that uh, the internal composition of the peasant sector is going to be important, especially when we try to the see the different uh, aspects. So, we try to see the internal composition of the internal composition of the peasant is going to be important and uh, we try to see its signification, uh, significance in terms of definition, definition of peasant. So, that is one way in which we try to see that how the peasantry are to be viewed in terms of the analysis of the peasant society. Another of course, is the relationship of peasant relationship of the peasants with the subgroups within the peasantry. So, another important way of analyzing the peasant is that relationship of peasant with the other peasantry means people who are living in the rural areas in the countryside and how the peasants are going to interact with them. That is another way in which we try to see the relationship between the two. I think uh, to be very specific we can say that the peasant versus the non-peasant sector that is how we can see uh, the broader understanding about the peasantry. And the third in that sense of course, is the use of the concept of the traditional culture, the use of the concept of the traditional culture which is going to be important and we try to see them in terms of a small or the little community. Now, I think that is also going to be crucial for understanding and analyzing the peasantry in terms of the analysis of the peasantry in detail. And finally, we try to see the significance of the history, significance of the history of the development of the typology of peasants. It basically indicate the sort of trajectory which is going to be there, the trajectory which marks the advent of or which marks the development of the peasantry through time that is going to be crucial. And in that way we try to see we can have certain operational definitions of peasantry because uh, the different developmental phase will have the different definitions that is going to be crucial. And in that way, if we try to see, we basically try to see that uh, uh, as we shift from the feudal society to the capitalistic society, we try to see that the peasantry also was in transition. So, we try to, to see a shift which has taken place. And as we were referring earlier also, that uh, when we try to speak about the understanding of the peasantry, we basically try to see that the peasantry was seen as the homogeneous category. So, the initial understanding or the notion of the peasantry goes in terms of the homogeneous categorization of the peasantry. But when we try to uh, see in the trends of development, when we try to see it in terms of uh, how the peasantry has made a remarkable shift, we try to find out that the first systematic attempt to analyze the peasantry in terms of analysis of the peasantry in terms of the so called uh, what you can say differentiation present differentiation, we try to see the contribution of V i Lenin. So, V i Lenin in 1920 was speaking about at length about uh, the different uh, categorization that is trying to see the heterogeneity within the peasantry. So, he was basically speaking about the present differentiation and in that way he tried to see them in terms of six different agrarian classes. six different agrarian classes and what are that? 
they are basically seen in terms of the agricultural uh, proletariats that is of course one thing we try to see in terms of ownership of means of production ownership of means of production that is the base on the base on on which we can have the formation of the classes and also in terms of the labor exploitation so i think uh, the two parameters uh, on which the agrarian classes are been divided divided and has been differentiated by vi lenin was on the ownership of the means of production and also on the labor exploitation and on the basis of that we can have the agricultural proletariats agricultural proletariat that is one then we try to see the semi proletariat that is semi proletariat that is second category we have the small peasant then we have the middle peasant and also we try to see the big peasant and finally we have the big land owners so i think uh, these are the uh, six different agrarian classes which has been spoken about by vi lenin in terms of the differentiation of the peasantry so on the one hand we try to speak about the fact that the peasantry are basically uh, the people or it is basically the society which is more homogeneous in terms of uh, uh, the culture in terms of uh, the family farm as a unit but uh, when we try to see the analysis of lenin he was basically trying to refer to the differentiation which has taken place in the peasantry and the different uh, formats or different classes uh, which he was speaking about is the agricultural proletariats semi proletariats small peasants middle peasants big peasants and the big land owners now this is basically uh, one interpretation uh, which basically is speaking about the contribution of uh, 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 lenin towards the differentiation of peasantry another name that deserves specific significance of course is the contribution of meo in terms of understanding of differentiation of peasantry so meo's contribution in terms of differentiation of the peasantry are to be seen in terms of ownership of means of production ownership of the means of production and also in terms of the wage labor so the two criteria which has been adopted by meo was for the differentiation of the peasantry was in terms of the ownership of means of production and also in terms of the wage labor and that is going to be a crucial variable uh, especially when we try to speak about the wage labor that how the wage labor is going to be a deciding factor when we try to analyze the peasantry and his analysis basically try to speak about the five different classes which are to be seen more in terms of what one can say the landlord then we try to see the rich peasant and also we have the middle peasant and along with that uh, we have the poor peasant and then finally we have the workers so in the a uh, rural setting especially when we try to speak about the agrarian class in terms of differentiation what meo was speaking about in terms of wage labor is that we can have the categorization not only on the ownership of means of production but also in terms of the wage labor and here we try to see that who can hire the wage and who can provide the wages in that sense or who receives the wages so like landlord if you try to see so landlord will be the Uh, uh having the means of production but they may not be uh offering labor rather they will be taking the wage labor similarly rich peasants having the uh, lesser means of production in terms of the uh, quantity but the wage labor also will be quite significant that hiring of the wage labor is going to be important 
but as we move towards the lower end to the poor peasant and the workers, we try to see that the means of production uh, criteria is going to be less significant or it is going to be less quantified, but the wage labor component is going to be higher. So, I think uh, this sort of understanding uh, try to give us an impression that the peasantry are sh should not be seen in terms of the homogeneous category, rather they are to be seen in terms of the differentiated masses. And I think uh, this was a significant shift uh, which took place when we try to see in terms of the ownership of means of production and the wage labor according to Mayo. So, we have that the Lenin's contribution and Mayo's contribution uh, in of classes of the peasantry and uh, we try to see it in terms of not only the means of production, but also in terms of the question of exploitation which is going to be significant. Uh, and I think uh, that can be seen in terms of a specific theoretical formulation to have the real class of peasantry, real class of peasantry. And uh, here if I just go back and refer to the contribution of Karl Marx uh, who is considered to be an important proponent for understanding or defining the class in terms of the ownership of means of production. We try to find out that uh, the contribution of uh, Marx for the analysis of the peasantry is going to be significant because he was simply trying to restrict it to the fact that the so called understanding about the uh, peasant was seen in terms of what you can say the vast mass which are not having the interaction it was trying to see in terms of uh, that their own mode of production is going to put them away from interaction with each other. So, we try to see that the class dimension of the Marx uh, for the analysis of the peasantry was missing. But when we try to see the contribution of Lenin and Mayo, I think they were uh, the significant uh, 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 contributors for analyzing the peasantry in terms of the class. And here, I think uh, when as we shared earlier also that when we try to speak about uh, the contribution in terms of uh, the question of exploitation, Eric Wolf's contribution is going to be significant especially his contribution which is to be seen in terms of uh, what you can say the exploitation. The peasants are seen as the subordinate and they are basically seen as the people who are been ruled. So, if we try to see uh, uh, Eric Wolf's contribution, we try to find out that he was trying to see them as the subordinates and also they are the people who have been ruled in that sense. So, I think uh, this is in relation to the wider society with relation to the cities in that sense as such and he tries to define it in terms of a population that are essentially involved in cultivation. involved in cultivation. But more than that, what is going to be important is that they are the autonomous, they are the autonomous in terms of decision making, autonomous decision makers in the process of cultivation. So, I think a certain amount of autonomy lies with them and that makes them are distinct although they are subordinate although they are been ruled, but they have the high yield of uh, they have the cultivation and where the decision lies with them. And I think uh, beyond that if you try to see uh, we have certain other uh, ways in which the peasantry has been seen because as we uh, see the transition which has taken place in the peasantry we try to find out that the peasantry is been marked by uh, the shift from the homogeneous, homogeneous structure to the heterogeneous structure. So, we try to see that the shift which has taken place from homogeneous structure to the heterogeneous structure, it basically involves uh, although homogeneous was seen more in terms of culture and the practices and heterogeneity is to be seen in terms of the ownership of means of production and also in terms of the question of exploitation that makes them as the unique category. And uh, we try to see that uh, uh, another important contribution which can be seen in the field of 
peasantry is uh, Landsberger contribution who tries to look peasantry in terms of the socio-economic and the political characteristics, socio-economic and the political characteristics in terms of the fact that they can register their protest, they can register their protest uh, and here we try to see that that registration, uh, registering against their protest is against the expectation which they are facing or which they have faced. So, basically it is against the, the so called the rural cla uh, ruler class. So, basically we try to see that the ruler class are been questioned and the exploitation done by them are been seen in terms of protest by the peasantry and this basically gives another important character to the understanding of the peasantry that we try to see that in the economic sense they are seen as class in itself in the Marxian framework if you try to see they are class in itself, but as we try to move ahead in terms of political class. So, this is the economic class, economic analysis of class uh, which we try to see peasantry in terms of class in itself and then we try to see a major shift which has taken place that is trying to speak about the political class. So, the political class we try to see it in terms of class for itself. So, this is a remarkable shift uh, which has taken place with regard to the understanding of the peasantry. We try to see if you can recall that uh, Shannon was speaking about the peasantry in terms of the underdog position and that underdog position was being seen with relation to the uh, outsiders. But as we move ahead, we try to see not only the differentiation in the peasantry, but the peasantry have the voices also. So, we try to see a significant shift uh, which has taken place and if we try to agree with this political class dimension of the peasantry, where they are trying to represent in terms of class for itself. So, then it indicates and it opens the new era and it opens the new dimension for looking to the peasantry. And what is that? Basically, we try to see peasantry in terms of the revolutionary potential. Ki if we try to speak about the peasantry in terms of analysis, we try to find out that the peasantry are not the docile masses, they are not the awkward classes, they are not the underdog uh, uh, situators or positions but they are basically seen as the people who can protest, who can show the resistance against the domination by others and they can come out with the significant ways in which the peasantry has to be seen. And we basically try to see that uh, this political character which has been uh, uh, added to uh, the peasantry gives a new understanding about the peasantry in even in the contemporary era. And this revolutionary potential was been visualized especially when we try to speak about the Mexican revolution. So, in the Mexican revolution which took place in 1910, we try to see the peasantry trying to have the resistance. Then even in the Russian revolution also, we try to see that Russian revolution which happened in 1905 and later on in 1917, it basically speaks about how the peasantry were being revolutionary and shows their strength. Then we have the Chinese revolution that was in 1921 onwards. We try to see that uh, peasantry was again significant. Then we have the Algerian rebellion of 1954, where also we try to see that uh, peasantry has shown the remarkable shift. And finally, when we try to speak about the Cuba revolution which was quite significant in the history of the world, we try to find out that the Cuba revolution also was found to have the sufficient uh, cause for understanding to the peasantry in terms of the political character. So, the revolutionary character of the peasantry basically reflects a new dimension to the understanding of the peasantry, especially when we try to speak about the fact, we try to basically pinpoint uh, one important issue that is we try to speak about that how the peasantry are seen as a shift from the homogeneous category to the heterogeneous category, how the, the position has shifted from 
what one can say the social or the cultural aspect in terms of homogeneity towards speaking about the contribution which is to be seen in terms of economic that is the class dimension which we are we try to see the heterogeneity and then we try to see the shift which has taken place further in terms of polity the political and where we try to see them in terms of the revolutionary character. So, I think uh, this is how we try to see uh, the different uh, format in which we can locate the peasantry and I think uh, when we try to apply the understanding of the peasantry in the context of India, I think uh, many uh, significant contribution uh, can be listed especially we try to see the contribution of Daniel Thorner. Daniel Thorner in 1956 was speaking about the uh, broader classification of the rural society and the agrarian classes are being seen in terms of uh, the basis of income obtained from the soil. Income obtained from the soil and in that way we try to see that uh, the so called peasantry can be differentiated into Malik. Kisan and Mazdur. So, we have the differentiation of the peasantry in terms of the income obtained from the soil as well as also on the extent of the field work which has been done by the peasantry extent of the field work and also we try to see the differentiation which has taken place as has been pointed by Daniel Thorner is we can have the categorization in terms of Malik Kisan and Mazdur. Similarly, we have the contribution by Utsa Patnaik. Utsa Patnaik was basically speaking about the understanding of peasantry uh, in 1976, especially in the exploration of the class character of the peasantry uh, in 19, uh, 1976. It was to be seen in terms of the question of labor exploitation. So, labor exploitation was seen as the criteria in terms of uh, the understanding of the class dimension of the peasantry in the Indian society and uh, it is basically the labor exploitation in terms of the use of the outsiders. So, how the labor exploitation in terms of use is going to be an important variable for understanding the class dimension of the peasantry and in that fashion if you try to see we try to find out that you have the poor class, you have the middle class, you have the lower class, you have the middle upper, middle upper and then you have the upper middle, you have the middle upper and then you have the rich capitalist. So, this be shift basically we try to see in terms of uh, uh, what you can say the labor exploitation and finally, I think uh, uh, the biggest exploiters uh, are to be seen in terms of the landlords. So, finally, the landlords which are seen as another category. So, the use of labor exploitation can refer to the various class structure in the rural India which of course, has been talked about by Utsa Patnaik. Uh, which tries to see in terms of the Marxian analysis. Then we have also the contribution of uh, uh, what you can say D. S. Swami, who was trying to see in terms of four classes, especially when we try to speak about uh, uh, the class structure in the rural society, the peasantry, we try to find out that uh, Shiva Kumar, uh, that D. S. Swami was trying to see it in terms of the landlord. Then he was trying to see it in terms of the poor peasant and also he was trying to see in terms of small peasants and well to do peasant. So, I think uh, these are the different ways in which the agrarian classes especially in the rural India has been experimented and uh, seen by the various scholars when we try to speak about uh, these characteristics, the shift which has taken in the world framework and also trying to see it in terms of
we try to see a uh, lot many uh, changes in terms of education because uh, their understanding may vary aspects and if you try to imitate and apply in the indian setting some i think uh, these dimensions of uh, locating peasantry into a understanding more sharper that how we can locate the peasantry both theoretically and in terms of practice. So, with these things uh, I think uh, we will have further discussions with regard to the specific theories of peasantry in the coming uh, units and with these words I think uh, we can go ahead with further readings uh, which will be suggested. Thank you.